Hi, welcome to Jazz Hidden Treasures. I'm Michael Hill. Jazz Hidden Treasures, just as the title implies, will introduce you to some of New Orleans' hidden treasures, performers who speak a language and tell a story through our native musical genre known as jazz. This show will bring you performances from some of the Crescent City's best jazz musicians, some you've no doubt heard of or seen perform. Others, well, we'll have to dive into the treasure trove and bring them out of obscurity. Jazz was born out of a mix of African and European musical traditions. Its African pedigree is evident in its use of blue notes, improvisation, polyrhythms, syncopation, and the swung note. From its early development until now, jazz has also incorporated, as you've no doubt heard, music from America's pop charts. Jazz is a musical style that originated at the beginning of the 20th century in black communities in America South. As the music has developed and spread around the world, it's drawn on countless cultures, giving rise to many distinctive styles. Each week, we'll showcase a jazz artist and the venues where you can enjoy their performances. Each week, a guest will join me as we explore the history of jazz and the future of jazz, that is, then and now. We set out with three main goals for Jazz Hidden Treasures. One, of course, is to entertain you, and two, certainly, to educate you, and three, to mentor young musicians as we celebrate this music. As a sponsor, you'll have an opportunity to advertise your product or services with a show that will snowball an opportunity with an important demographic that has plenty of disposable income, a range from 25 years of age and up, as we build jazz hidden treasures through multimedia, that is, traditional radio and television, the new World Wide Web, and of course, ubiquitous social media. Up first, New Orleans native, saxophonist, and both a student and mentor of jazz, Aaron Fletcher.
Welcome back to Jazz Hidden Treasures. My guest today is a New Orleans native and saxophonist who began playing music at the age of six. He's performed with some of the best names in the music industry, Branford and Whit Marsalis, Harry Connick Jr., Stevie Wonder, Terrence Blanchard, Tina Marie, and Anita Baker, just to name a few. Here's Mr. Aaron Fletcher. Welcome to Jazz Hidden Treasures. What's going on, Mike? How you doing, man? I'm doing well, buddy. How about you? I'm fine. It's fine. I'm curious about this. You began playing at the age of six. How did that happen? Uh, I, I grew up playing in church, like so many musicians that I, I play with. And, um, you know, it was one of those things where you had so many musicians around you that you wanted to see what, you know, all the fuss was about. And that's how I got into it. So was it the saxophone you were playing? I first started with drums, like most kids. You know, you beat on whatever you can get. But Pots the and pans? Exactly. <laughs> exactly. But the saxophone was the first thing that I noticed, and I, I just had to have. I had to figure out what was, what was it about that instrument that, you know. So at what, what age did Aaron Fletcher say, I'm going to be a jazz saxophonist? Um, well, the jazz part didn't come until later, but I was just so enthralled with the instrument that I investigated other styles as well. Like that classical music came first as when I was really young, outside of playing in church, of course. Right. And, uh, you know, a series of records that I actually encountered really inspired me to take it to another level. Like what? Um, well, Gerald Albright was one of the first artists that I really dug, and one of his albums, was, you know, was the thing that touched me. Um, hearing gospel musicians like Bernard Johnson when I was really young, and classical musicians like um, Eugene Rousseau, and, you know, just a variety of instrument, a variety of um, artists and influences. Did your parents think that this was just an infatuation of a 10-year-old kid? Did they really think that, okay, Aaron really wants to play the saxophone? They believed it. Um, they believed it because I, 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 I was so enthusiastic about it, right. and there were people around me who were just as enthusiastic when they heard me do what I do. And they believed it, and I'm glad they believed in it, and they nurtured it as much as they could. Well, how did you manage to take them from that, that love of the saxophone to a formal education early on to make sure that you got the right foundation for, for the saxophone? Well, it, it's, it's sort of a balance of both. I think when you play in an environment such as a church or, um, you know, gigs or anything like that, you actually take on another education as right. opposed to having a formal education like being in a band or doing one of those things where you go to lessons. So it's, it's like a nice balance of having the best of both worlds. You know? We mentioned you performing with some of the biggest names in the music industry. Surely you've got some stories from out there on the road. Yeah, the, the Nita Baker story is like my all-time story because um, that was my first big road gig. And that night, the first gig, I, I got sick, like ridiculously sick in the Bahamas of all places, right? So at the end of the gig, Anita drove by in a golf cart and she hears me like sneezing all over the place. And she invited me in for tea, which I thought was kind of cool because, you know, on stage she was so demanding and it had to be this way. So for her to come down off of that boss pedestal, actually come down and be nurturing, it was just... It was a shock. I had to call my mom after it was all over and tell her what happened. You mentioned nurturing. Tell me something about what you're doing to mentor young New Orleanians when it comes to music. Well, I think as a musician, you eventually get to a point where you have to, you sort of give back in a variety of ways. Most right. guys record records and that's their way of contributing to the younger audience's education. Most, peop most people, like if you live in a city like New Orleans, you have that accessibility to older musicians. Like I had Donald Harrison and Wenton and Branford and the Clyde Kerrs of the world and the Ellis's. And you know, it's one of those things where you eventually evolve into that role. Mm -hmm. And I'm starting to become that guy now. You so certainly are. That's what happens when you're a rising star. Yeah, that's what I hear. Yeah, that's that's what I hear. Star. Our friend Aaron <laughs> Fletcher here at Jazz Hidden Treasures. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you, Mike. You're welcome. And we'll be right back. Welcome back to Jazz Hidden Treasures. My next guest is a great clarinetist, band leader, composer, musical educator, and jazz historian. He's performed in countless festivals to celebrate jazz, like the New Orleans Jazz and Heritage Festival, the French Quarter Festival, the Satchmo Summerfest, just to name a few. Dr. Michael White, welcome to Jazz Hidden Treasures. Thank you. You're welcome, sir. When I think of jazz in New Orleans, I think of you and the words that come up, hardcore jazz artists. Hardcore. <laughs> well, you know, jazz in New Orleans is uh, is a very special thing. Uh, despite all the great musical styles we have here, the only thing that was actually created in New Orleans and didn't exist anywhere else before was jazz. And uh, you know, like many other musicians, I come from a New Orleans musical family that goes back to the very beginning of jazz. And uh, you know, I'm part of the uh, continuation of that tradition. Now, you mentioned that there was some other music in New Orleans that, that, that seems to uh, uh, be predominant right now, some of the hip-hop and some of the other 
uh, uh, genres. Do any of those influence jazz today in New Orleans, jazz uh, in, in America? Well, you know, jazz uh, is a very special music because more than a set repertoire, it's a style or an approach to playing, and it takes in many other musical genres or styles. So you could turn uh, music from almost any style of music into jazz, whether it be traditional New Orleans jazz or, or more mo modern forms of jazz as well. Now, you <coughs> teach at Xavier. You're a professor there, but also an endowed chair, is that correct? Yes, uh, uh, I hold the Rosa and Charles Keller endowed chair in the humanities. And you basically are fluent in Spanish because you teach Spanish as well? Well, I taught Spanish for 25 years at wow. Xavier, but my degrees are in Spanish. A lot of people think, you know, Dr. Michael White, that it's a, a doctorate in music, but uh, no, my doctorate is actually in Spanish. Now, you're still performing? Still performing? Yes. yes. I perform quite a lot. How often do you perform? Uh, well, that's actually a secret, but I perform as much as I can. <laughs> and you still love it? I love it very much with a, with a passion because it's, it's, it's like life, it's like breathing, it's like eating, so it never gets tired or boring for me. Even if I play the same songs on certain jobs, uh, I try to come at it with a fresh approach. So it's always like it's new to me. Now it's important for someone with your jazz pedigree to make sure that people understand jazz in 2012 and 2013. How do you bring jazz from its history to its present and to its future? Well, I think that's a very important thing. I think people don't know enough about the history of jazz, of early jazz. First of all, what the actual authentic music is. And then uh, an important point is that when jazz was created during the post-reconstruction period, during the 1890s, not only was it uh, fun and danceable music satisfying the traditional New Orleans need for celebration, but at the same time, in a sense, it was sort of like a, a social protest in a way, not a violent social protest, but one that sort of pointed toward American democracy, served as a model or a metaphor for American democracy uh, by having many of the elements of democracy, like freedom, and it showed how you can have individuality, free expression, uh, collectivism, and all within a structured uh, order without completely destroying the social order. And it showed how you could allow for uh, diversity, incorporation of different ideas, uh, and open up concepts like possibility. And in jazz, you were also um, exalting both the individual and the collective, giving a voice to a downtrodden people who um, didn't really have visibility in society. You were bringing them, them into the highest degree of visibility in a way in which through the music, uh, one could express one's true feelings, one's true thoughts, one's intelligence, one's creativity. You could also express a wide range of emotions like anger and uh, joy, happiness, frustrations. But it is like the ultimate expression of American freedom and democracy. And it came from, of course, the African-American population of New Orleans. Dr. Michael White, an original here in New Orleans. And I wish we had more time to talk to you because I hear the Village Vanguard in New York is not the same since you performed there 17 years ago. <laughs> well, we played there for 17 years in a row, uh, the original Liberty Jazz Band, and we created quite a sensation. Uh, we were the only traditional New Orleans style band to play at the Vanguard because it's known for, you know, as a haven for modern jazz and even avant-garde. But, you know, we play the music very creatively uh, and authentically and, and it captured a crowd. We had, you know, great audiences and, you know, a number of celebrities would come to see us. We've had national broadcasts from there, so we did very well. Okay. Dr. Michael White, thank you, sir. Thank you. Good. And we'll be right back.
I'm Dr. Michael White, and this is a little-known jazz fact about the great Louis Armstrong. Today, Louis Armstrong is best remembered as a singer for such songs as What a Wonderful World, Hello, Dolly, and Mac the Knife. But not everyone knows that in the 1920s, Louis Armstrong was the greatest and most influential jazz musician who changed the course and direction of jazz and American popular music. In jazz, Louis Armstrong almost single-handedly took emphasis away from collective improvisation and made the hot, swinging, improvised solo become the main feature of jazz, which it still remains today. The effect of Louis Armstrong in jazz cannot be overstated. He was like the invention of the wheel. Louis Armstrong mastered every aspect of playing. He had technical command over the instrument. He was the first jazz high note trumpet player. He had a compelling feeling for the blues. Armstrong mastered rhythms and phrases that were previously unheard of. In the mid-1920s on his Hot Five and Hot Seven recordings, Louis Armstrong taught the world how to swing and gave us the ultimate example of American creativity, freedom, and democracy. Thus, Louis Armstrong represented the ultimate in American creativity and free expression. This is a little-known jazz fact.